Well, good morning, Rock Hill. My name's Kelsey. I'm one of the pastors here. And it's so great to be able to gather together and worship with you this morning. If you're new here, we would love uh, to give you a gift. If you fill out that welcome card that's on the bottom of the bulletin uh, and meet us in the glass room after the service, we've got a Rock Hill mug and a gift card for you if it's your first time here. This morning, we're continuing in our John sermon series. This morning, Kyle is going to be kicking it off with John 1. And I just want to read from Psalm 92 as we begin this morning. The psalmist writes, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning I pray that we would sing with joy of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would be moving this morning through Kyle, through the worship, through whatever means you would care to use this morning. Holy Spirit, we just pray that you would speak. Jesus, we pray that your name would be lifted high. And in your name we pray. Amen.
we praise you as the one who holds all things together. God, even in the beginning, as the Father spoke, you, the Word, went forth and created the Son. And each and every day, you hold all things together, including creation, causing the sun to rise each and every day, reminding us of your faithfulness. And God, as the snow melts here, finally, hopefully, uh, we just rejoice in the spring that comes after the winter, the new life that is budding, that is showing. May that remind us of the work that you do through your spirit in our hearts, bringing new life. 
out of what was dead, what was dark. God, I just pray that through the, the words we sing today, through the sermon that is preached, through the fellowship of believers, that Jesus Christ would be glorified above all as the true God, the one who holds all things together. We pray this in his powerful name. Amen. You can take a brief moment to maybe meet someone new around you. And when Kyle comes up, please find your seats. All right, if you can find your way back to your seats, that'd be great. We're going to be in John chapter 1. All right, John chapter 1 this morning. Before we uh, get into that, I just want to make a quick announcement. Next Sunday, can you guys hear me? Okay. You just actually like each other and want to talk? I get it. It's all good. Um, next Sunday, after the second service, we're actually going to have a children's baptism service at like 1230. Um, which is awesome. If you're a, a kid and maybe have made a decision to follow Jesus Christ and, and want to obey him in baptism, but don't really like the idea of standing up in front of 200 people, um, this is actually an opportunity for you. We, we've got two kids that want to be baptized, and so uh, for the rest of you, you can come and celebrate with them. Uh, but if you are interested, or parents, if you've had conversations with your kids, and that might be something they'd be interested in, uh, why don't you talk with them and then let me know. But we've already got two, so we can have a few more if we want. Uh, just let me know about that. And then for the rest of us, what a cool thing to celebrate, right? It's totally worth delaying lunch for a little bit longer uh, if we get to celebrate like that. So, all right, let's pray, and we will be in John 1. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the chance that we have now to see Jesus anew uh, through a passage that for some is very familiar and others that maybe haven't heard it before. Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes to Christ this morning? Lord, I, I know that people need to see him more than they need to hear from me. And so would you do that through me or in spite of me? Help us to understand who Jesus is and respond accordingly. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week at Easter, we dove into the Gospel of John, and we're going to be here for about a year. And so this morning, we're going to look at the introduction or the prologue of John. But the Gospel of John asks questions like, who is Jesus? What is he like? What exactly is this life that he is inviting me into all about? And the prologue or the intro of John answers many of these questions to explain and invites us to explore the person and the work of Jesus even more. Let me read it, and I would just say this is some of the most beautiful words, poetry, I think, ever written. It's easy to get lost in the beauty of it and not see what it is, and so I pray that we would both get lost in the beauty and see the person of whom it's talking about. So John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the light, life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. There's a lot going on in this rather odd introduction to the life of Jesus from the Apostle John. And if you're anything like me, sometimes it's helpful to not just hear things about how it's ordered and structured, but actually see it laid out. I want to show you a video that's no longer than what we would normally look at. It's six minutes long from the Bible Project that does just such a fantastic job of laying out the structure and the teaching of what John is introducing us to. Uh, there are so many amazing resources at thebibleproject.org that if you like this, uh, I just would invite you to go there and, and you'll just, you'll, your mind will be blown. I'll just put it that way. So here's the Bible Project, John 1. In the Bible, there are four accounts of the life of Jesus that altogether are called the Gospel. And the Gospel of John begins by introducing Jesus as the Word of God. What does that mean for a person to be a word? Yeah, it's a great question. Let's check it out. So John's account has 21 chapters, and it begins with a carefully designed prologue that places Jesus' story in a cosmic context. It starts like this. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, that's how the story of the whole Bible begins. In the beginning, God created the skies and the land. Right, John is claiming that to really understand who Jesus is, you need to start way, way back in the beginning. And what was God doing in the beginning? He was speaking his creative word into the darkness. Words like, let there be light, let the dry land appear, let plants grow. Picture a king who can get things done just by speaking a word. That's how God speaks in Genesis 1, 10 times. And each word turns the dark chaos into an ordered cosmos that is full of life. Creation hears the word and obeys. Now, think about it. A person's word is their word because it embodies their thoughts. But as it goes out from them, it becomes separate. It's this idea that John explores next. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Notice how John has designed this opening statement. So the outer lines are about the word's eternal nature. He's from the beginning. And then the center lines are a claim about the word's identity. The word is both with God and is God. They're two and also one. Now, after these opening lines are six more paragraphs that are arranged in two matching groups. The first three tell the story of Jesus with imagery drawn from the scroll of Genesis. Creation began with God bringing light into darkness, and now, with the coming of Jesus, God's beginning a new creation. In him was life, and that life was the light of a humanity. And the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not overcome it. In the next paragraph, we meet a new character, John the Baptizer. Yeah, he was preparing Israel for something new that God was going to do by bearing witness to Jesus when he arrived. John came as a witness so he could bear witness to the light, so that everyone could believe through him. After this, the third paragraph explores the choice people face when God's light enters the world through Jesus. 
Some choose to stay in the dark, but others enter the light and are recreated, reborn as new kinds of humans. Unto his own he came, but his own did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, he gave authority to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So these three paragraphs summarize the story of Jesus as God's word bringing light to the darkness. All imagery from Genesis. Right. And now watch. John will go back and retell the same story again, but this time with imagery taken from the scroll of Exodus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, the glory of the one and only from the Father. So the eternal word of God entered into creation by becoming a mortal human named Jesus. And he dwelt among us? Yeah, the Greek word for dwelt is skenen. It means literally to live in a tent. John is comparing Jesus to the sacred tabernacle that Moses built at Mount Sinai, the place where God's glorious presence came to live and unite with his people. So Jesus is a human tabernacle? Yeah, he's the reality to which the tabernacle pointed, the place where God and humanity are united as one. Next, we get another mention of John the baptizer who's bearing witness to Jesus, saying, This is the one of whom I said, the one who comes after me actually precedes me because he was long before me. After this, John tells about how he and his friends actually met Jesus and how they made the choice to follow and trust him and so were transformed by his light. From his fullness, we all received grace upon grace. The Torah was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Messiah. John was an Israelite, part of the family, that received through Moses the generous gift of the Torah that shared God's word and wisdom. And now, through Jesus, John and his fellow Israelites have received the ultimate gift of God's truth and love, Jesus himself. And this time, God's word isn't written. It's a person. Exactly. Now, to wrap things up, John concludes the prologue with words that echo the opening lines. No one has ever seen God, the one and only God who is in the lap of the Father. That one has made known. So, on the one hand, God is transcendent and above all, totally other. And if that were the end of the story, God would remain distant from us. But then John starts talking about this one and only God who is in the lap of the Father. Now, what does that mean? Well, remember in the prologue opening, John used the image of God and God's word. Now he uses another image of a father whose son is sitting really close. A king and his word, a father and his son, they're both ways of saying the same thing. Right, John wants to make clear that the Jesus he knew was both distinct from God and also God. And as God's word and son and light and glory, Jesus came to make known. Yeah, to make known what? Yeah, exactly. In Greek, John doesn't say, he actually leaves the sentence open. He forgot to finish the last sentence? No, it's on purpose. It's John's invitation to keep reading the story so you can discover for yourself what Jesus wants to make known to you. Ultimately, John sees the whole story of the Bible as an invitation to know and be known by the Father and the Son who together are the one God. Oh, isn't that so good? It just visually uses technology to help us understand and comprehend the Bible. If you like that, there's so much more content at thebibleproject.org. As people that are shaped and formed by God's Word, what a great opportunity that we have in this generation that thousands of generations haven't had. I mean, we can get that for free. It's amazing. Now, some of you guys are thinking, it's going to be really hard for the sermon to top that. And you're right. That was probably the peak of what you're going to experience this morning. But for the rest of the time, I just want to tease out the implications of this introduction to John's letter. We're going to see three things here. We're going to see the identity of Jesus, the character of Jesus, and then the invitation that Jesus or John gives us from Jesus. So what does this say about the identity of Jesus? That's the primary thing that John is talking about here. Uh, what we'll see first is that Jesus is the Word of God who created everything. See that in verses 1 to 3. Second, that Jesus is the light of the world that revealed the wisdom, that reveals wisdom and truth. So by him we see, see that in verses 4 and 5 and 8 and 9. And then third, that Jesus is the presence of God on this earth, or he tabernacled or revealed God to us. So he's the word, he's the light, he's the presence of God or the tabernacle of God 
on this earth. That's who he is. Let's look at each of those, all right? Jesus is the word of God who created everything. This is what John first wants us to to see. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So in using this language, John draws our attention not just to the beginning of the story of Jesus coming to the earth, but the very beginning of the biblical story in Genesis 1. He makes it clear that the word that was spoken by God at creation is actually Jesus, distinct from God and yet one with God. This is a profound mystery, isn't it? A little bit confusing. He is distinct from God and yet one with God. Uh, He's introducing us or continuing to teach us what the Trinity is or God at its very nature. One plus one plus one equals one. Makes sense, right? Now, some people will, will hear that and they'll think, well, that's absurd. How can God be distinct from himself and still yet united in himself? And the answer is yes, God is who God is. And he reveals to us who he is. And actually, rather than fully being able to understand and articulate God, maybe we were created to worship and stand in awe of him instead. Do you really want a God that you can fully understand and just articulate in a few simple sentences? Or would you rather worship a God that is profound and mysterious and you spend the rest of your life discovering nuances and mysteries of who he is? Yes. In fact, I want to spend all eternity discovering and rediscovering and learning more and more of who God is. And so we learn here that Jesus is no mere created being, nor is he the first in creation. He is God in every way, and he was not only there at creation, but he, in fact, did the creating through this word-speaking process. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to conclude that that is a pretty bold claim to make about an itinerant Jewish rabbi who found himself crucified. And yet, that is exactly what Christians from the very beginning have believed about Jesus because God's word tells us that's who he is. Jesus is far more than a mere man. He is God come in the flesh. More on that later on. Now, we can articulate these things, and most church doctrinal statements will say these things, at least Orthodox churches, will say these exact things. You'll find that in almost every single church confession or doctrinal statement. But why is it so important that we acknowledge that Jesus is the creator God? Well, there are actually a lot of implications about that. First, one, if Jesus is the creator God, then we are beholden to him. Did you know that the first verse in the Bible is by far the most controversial verse? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It establishes not God proving his existence, but merely being there. And everything else exists because God willed it to exist. And that God is, as we read in John, Jesus, the Word. And if Jesus is indeed the creator of everything, including us, then he can do what he wills with creation, can't he? He is not accountable to us. Rather, we find ourselves accountable to him. Uh, The illustration that the New Testament uses, uh, and actually quotes from the Old Testament, is that the potter is able to do whatever he wants with the lump of clay. See, if he's making a a clay or a ceramic pot on a wheel, he can do whatever he wants. And if it's not going very well, he could throw it away and start over, or he could lump it together and reshape it and form it. And and, and the, the potter doesn't owe that lump of clay any explanation. Nor does the clay have a say in what it's being made into. Now, that's a crude analogy that doesn't fit in every way, but it's one that the Bible uses. If Jesus is indeed the creator, then he is the one that we are accountable to, not the other way around. Now, how do I know if I'm drifting into that kind of thinking? Well, everything that happens, or anything that happens that doesn't make sense to you, is your immediate response, how could God, as if God is in the in the, in the, in the in the box and he needs to provide an explanation to you or is your immediate response that God is God and can do whatever he wants 
even if it doesn't make sense to me. Now, the second implication about Jesus being God is that if Jesus is God, then the good news is we don't have to be. And you're thinking, well, Pastor Kyle, how is that good news? I actually kind of want to determine right and wrong for myself. I actually want to be in charge of everything. In fact, if I was, things would, uh, would, would finally get put to right. Are you serious? Look at your life. How's it going? I'm so glad I'm not God. And you are too. Glad that I'm not God. And glad that you're not God. Because we have made a mess of things. Jesus is God, so we don't have to be. We are freed from that responsibility. There are some things that don't fall onto our shoulders. We are not responsible for them, but he is. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Horse and His Boy, it tells the story of a a prince who was kidnapped and brought to a faraway land, and through a talking horse, he ends ends up finding his way back to this land and saving it from from an invasion. The boy's name is Shasta, but he actually really learns that his name is Kor, and he has a twin brother, Corin, and it becomes clear that he actually is the oldest brother by 20 minutes, and so therefore he is the one who's going to be king. As a young boy, he's like, well, that's awful. But father, he says, couldn't you make whoever you like to be the next king? No, said his father, the king's under the law, for it's the law that makes him a king, has no more power to start away from the crown than any century from his post. To abandon it. Oh dear, said Cor, I don't want that at all. And Corin, his younger brother, I'm, I'm most dreadfully sorry. I never dreamed my turning up was going to chisel you out of your kingdom. Hurrah, hurrah, said Corin. I shan't have to be king. I shan't have to be king. I'll always be a prince. It's the princes that have all the fun. <laughs> the king says, that's truer than your brother knows. For this is what it means to be a king, to be the first in every desperate attack and last in every desperate retreat. And when there's hunger in the land, as must be now and then in bad years, to wear finer clothes and laugh louder over a scanter meal than any man in your land. See, the younger brother rightly realizes, wait a second, there's a responsibility that comes with being king, and I'd rather just have fun, like a little boy, right? Here's the truth. Jesus is God, so we don't have to be. And that is really, really good news. Not only because we would make a mess with our rule and reign, but also because he has the responsibility of determining what is right and wrong and setting the right path. If Jesus is God, then part of his being God is that he gets to determine what is right and what is wrong. I don't have to settle that myself. I can listen to him. And I think this is actually freedom of the highest degree which is what John introduces next. That Jesus is not just the word that created everything, but he is the light of God that reveals wisdom and truth. Verse 4 and 5 and 8 and 9. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 8. He, John, was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. One more C.S. Lewis quote, and then I'll be done, I promise. But this one's one of my favorites. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Light is a beautiful thing. Not only can you see it when the sun rises on the horizon or someone turns on a lamp in a dark room, but also because when the sun rises or the lamp is turned on, you can see everything else around because of the light. Jesus says later in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John introduces us to Jesus as the light, the one who illumines everything or helps us to see. What he's saying in using this metaphor is that Jesus reveals the wisdom of God, the insight, the truth of God to us so that we can know things rightly. Like wisdom personified in uh, Proverbs chapter 8, revealing what the good life is. From the beginning of creation, Jesus is the wisdom and the light of God. So why does that matter? Well, a couple things. First, when light and darkness meet, who wins? The light does. 
light overcomes or pierces the darkness. Just as the wisdom and insight and light of God in Jesus will overcome sin and darkness, he will win. He's the light. But second, Jesus as the light or the wisdom of God gets to determine for us what the good life is. His insight is more important than ours. We rest and find peace when we see in him the wisdom and insight of God. Now, I know it's in vogue today to say, well, you do you, and I'll do me. And we got to be true to ourselves. And we got to figure things out. And if I'm true to my feelings, then I'll become my authentic self. How's that working for us? How are we doing? Not so good. Why? Because I got to believe that my identity is rooted in something far greater than my fickle feelings or urges or desires in any given moment. In fact, the good life is probably not best determined by me or by you, but rather someone with a little bit more credentials. Someone who actually knows what the good life is. Someone who actually created the life that you and I get to experience day in and day out. Embracing Jesus as the light and the wisdom of God means that he is the one who knows what the good life is. He is the one who determines what is right and what is wrong. He is the one who identifies you and me, and we can actually find rest in freedom and embracing the identity he gives us rather than forging our own. See, what seems like freedom just becomes another obscure and weird form of bondage that we're seeing people and many of ourselves experience over and over and over again. It's far more freeing to take what the light says and embrace it, even if it doesn't immediately make sense to us, but that it's a good life. So Jesus is the word of God who created everything. He is the light of God who reveals the wisdom and truth that by it we may see. One more claim that John makes about Jesus in verse 14. Jesus is the presence of God on this earth. And the word became flesh and tabernacled or dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has revealed, or he has made him known. As the video said, John moves from the imagery of word and light from Genesis 1 to now the, the second book of the Torah, the book of Exodus, and that of the tabernacle, or the tent of meeting, the place where the people of God would draw near to God, where heaven and earth would meet. But now John is claiming that the, the new tabernacle of God is not a tent, and it's not a building. It's a person, and his name is Jesus. The word of God became flesh, and he dwelt among us. This is what we celebrate at Christmas time. God, Emmanuel, drawing near to us. God entering our world, taking on a human body. Sometimes it's easy for us to, get, to think about God as just being transcendent and holy and the creator, totally other from us, and he is. He is those things. He, he spoke, and atoms and cells were created and bonded together and began to work com together in, in complexity to create certain cells and organisms, and it blows your mind. God spoke, and the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets existed. We are not peers. God is not our buddy, right? Right? But what makes Christianity so distinct, so radical, so beautiful, is that we believe that that word, that light, that wisdom, took on human flesh. He drew near to us. Drew near to us who had rebelled against him. Drew near to us in our brokenness and sin. Drew near to us who had rejected his light and his wisdom and decided in our hearts that we could do a better job than him. I mean, if you go back to Genesis 2 and 3, the command of God to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a way in which Adam and Eve would exercise faith that God is good and a rewarder of those who seek him. 
But the fundamental reality of reaching out and taking it was saying, no, we can do a better job. If we were left to say what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, we'd be in a lot better shape. That's why the world's so broken. And God would have been absolutely within his rights to simply wipe us out or to leave us to to sleep in the bed that we had made. But we see that Jesus took on human flesh and God drew near to us to seek and save us who are lost. Why does that matter? Well, it shows us that God cares. While being transcendent, he is not distant or aloof. He draws near to us. He comes to us. He enters our brokenness. And the way that he overcomes it will show us the full extent of his love. Guys, what you need to know this morning is that God is not indifferent to you. He loves you. He cares for you. He draws near to you. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is God drawing near to us, revealing more fully who God is, showing to us God's true character once and for all, which leads us beyond the identity of Jesus into the character of Jesus. Look at verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known, or he has revealed. Come check it out. It's not as though God had been silent before Jesus came. No, he had given his people the law through Moses so that they would know what is right and what is wrong. They would know what God requires of them. The only problem is they didn't keep it. It revealed not only God's character, but their need for someone to come and save them out of the mess. God gave them the kings to rule and uphold his law, and very few of them actually did. He called his people back to covenant faithfulness through the prophets, calling them back to obey God and to live justly. He gave them a way to draw near to himself, even though they were sinful through the priesthood and the sacrifice. But now, after all of that, we read that God reveals himself most fully through his son coming in the flesh. The author of Hebrews tries to grasp this in the beginning of his letter. He says this, long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son he created the universe. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. And according to John, how is God's character most fully or clearly expressed? By being full of both grace and truth. The Father's glory is most clearly revealed in the Son by being the full embodiment of grace and and truth. John writes, for from this fullness we have received grace upon grace. What does that even mean? The way that John writes just invites you to stop and think about it, doesn't it? To meditate on what he is saying, to to ponder what in the world could grace upon grace be. Jesus reveals the Father full of grace and truth. See, grace without truth is mere sentimentality, isn't it? a flimsy affection that is utterly lacking in substance. You do you sounds nice. It sounds loving, but often pat someone on the back as they continue to pursue broken and destructive and enslaving behaviors. Truth without grace, on the other side, can be cruel, harsh, inflexible, 
caring more about being right than being helpful. But we see in Jesus that he is both fully at the same time. And in this, he reveals to us the Father's nature and glory that we don't have to choose between being gracious people and being truth-filled people. That we can boldly stand on the truth, even take shots for the truth in an uncompromising way, but do so with grace and kindness. Let me give you an example. Do we let sinners into the church? I sure hope so, or I gotta leave. And so do you. See, the very beginning of our relationship with God is our acknowledging our need for him. The fact that we have fallen short of his perfect standard and that there is a savior whose name is Jesus who has done something for us that we can't possibly do ourselves. But do we let sinners into church to continue to do whatever it is that they want to do? never acknowledging the lordship of Jesus Christ, never believing what he says about the good life, about what is right and about what is wrong, about who we are and how we were created. No. Because that's the fundamental denial of who Jesus is and the authority that he has. We proclaim the good news and the grace of the gospel, which is Jesus' victory over sin, not simply his tolerance of it. It is something that we receive by his sheer grace. But then we acknowledge the goodness of our Lord. We let him be God, the light, the decisive word on all things. Which leads to the invitation of Jesus where we'll close. Verse 9. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen? Who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The people who should have recognized him and received him and believed in him the ones who were waiting for Messiah to come, missed him. They didn't see, and they rejected who he was. Now this invitation is given to all who will receive him. Do you you hear the invitation given to you and to me in this mere introduction about Jesus' life? He gives to all who believe in his name salvation and the right to become children of God. What does that mean? It means that we can become the covenant people of God, invited into the very family of Trinitarian love. The love that God the Father has for the Son and the Spirit, we are invited into this family, as it were. If that doesn't blow your mind, it should. And it's because we're going we're to see this theme come up over and over and over in John's gospel, and it is awesome. We are born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or will, but born of God. What does that even mean? It means that we're born again, not because of our ancestry, whether we're Jewish or any other descent, or whether we had great or not so great parents, nor are we born again by mere human decision or because of the will of a husband. John is teasing out that this new kind of birth that he will explain more later in the gospel account is a different kind of life. To be born of God is a change so radical that it's illustrated as being born again, reborn into a new family, God's family. And this new family is so amazing that we're going to have to pinch ourselves to see if it is indeed real. The good news of the gospel is that we get God. We get him. We get relationship with him. And Jesus lives the life that we should have lived, laying down the righteousness that we should have attained but didn't, that by faith in his name becomes ours. He died the death that you and I deserve to die, bearing the punishment for our sins. And he rose again in victory, showing us the hope that we have in him by what he has done. And what that does is that invites us into the very family and nature of God. And sometimes we share it in such a way where we think Jesus forgives us so that we can get what we really want, which is our sin. What a misunderstanding. 
guys, the good news of the gospel is that you can be in relationship with God the way that you were created to be, finding the, the, the security and the identity that you have longed for your whole life, that you were created to find in him, and it can be yours in Christ. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. These children of God acknowledge that Jesus is the word of God who created all things, the light of God who reveals to us wisdom and truth, the very presence of God here on earth, the one who embodies for us grace and truth. And so the invitation that John gives is the invitation I give to you today. Believe in Jesus, trust in him, become children of God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it shapes us, informs us, it provokes us, it challenges us, and it invites us to embrace the good life. Help us to see who Jesus reveals, which is the Father, and help us by believing to find life in his name. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. We're going to transition in our time of worship now to the communion table, which is something that we do over and over and over again to remember the good news of the gospel. Some of you guys are thinking, why do we need to remember the gospel over and over again? Why do we need to, why do we need to eat bread and drink juice? It's not that great. It's just bread and it's just juice. Why do we have to remember the gospel? Well, why do you have to eat and drink today? You did it yesterday. It's because your body was created to, to need the nourishment of food and drink. It sustains your physical life. In the same way, our faith is encouraged and nourished by remembering the good news of the gospel. Remembering who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Reorienting our brains and our lives around this central truth that God saves sinners in Jesus, like me and like you. So Jesus, the last night that he was with his disciples, he gave them this meal to remind them to never forget what he was about to do. He says, this bread is my body broken for you. This cup represents my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you eat it and drink it in remembrance of me. And so Christians around the world gather today and we do this, remembering in a universal sense Jesus' salvation, but also remembering in an incredibly intimate and personal sense Jesus' salvation of us, giving us the right to become children of God who are welcome at the family table. So if you're here this morning and you're part of the family of God, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to save you, then you are welcome at this table. Whether you're a member of this church or not, if you are a member of God's family, you are welcome to remember his body broken and his blood shed for you. If you're here this morning and you're not, you haven't put your trust and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, then there are really two options for you. The first is if you're not there, if you're not convinced, if you're you're exploring, but you're just, that's a big deal to give my life to Jesus, to, to believe that, to trust in him. And you're not there. I have no desire to manipulate you into any kind of decision today. You remain in your seat during this time, and, and don't be a hypocrite testifying to what isn't true. If you're wondering, will people judge me or think I'm weird? No, we've all been there before. It is a monumental step to to cross that line of faith, so to speak, and to to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him alone for salvation. However, if you're here this morning and you realize, oh man, I need him. I need him to save me. I need him to be my savior. Then I would invite you to believe in the one in whom welcomes you to the family of God. Trust that what Jesus did, he did not just for people in general, but for you, for your sin. Living your life, dying your death, and rising again so that you might have hope. Believe in him, put your faith and trust in him. Acknowledging your need and welcoming and receiving his grace. And if that's you, then you are welcome today for the first time in your life to participate in this meal in faith. Let me pray. God, thank you for this great reminder of your incredible goodness and truth. 
Jesus, I thank you that you are so full of grace and truth. And so we remember now your body broken for us and your blood shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, God, that as we come forward, we are testifying not only of our faith, but we are testifying to all around us that we are children of God and that we, are, that we need your grace. Nourish and encourage our faith, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. As we begin to sing, you can come down the center aisle, grab a piece of bread and dip it in the cup and return down the side aisle. There'll be a gluten-free station here in the middle. Would you come as we sing? See
pray with me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Father, we need more and more of your grace and favor and forgiveness and kindness and mercy upon us. As we go from this place, may we have confidence and hope that the darkness shall not overcome the light, the light of the world, the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. Give us grace as we go from this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stay standing. I just have very one, uh, one very brief announcement. Uh, if you are new to Rock Hill, and I know that there are a lot of new people, just given the amount of people we had last week in Easter, uh, I want to invite you to Pizza with the Pastor. This is a monthly lunch that we do. It's very casual. Uh, it's right after this service across the street uh, in the church office. And the goal of this lunch is just for you to get to know us and for us to get to know you if you're new here. So feel free to pop by. It'll start in about 15 minutes or so. Uh, the church office is labeled office, so it's hard to miss right across the street. Uh, we're going to have a prayer team up here after the service if you need prayer for anything. Rock Hill, you are now not dismissed, but you are sent to declare, display, and delight in the gospel. Go in peace.